This is Smarter Cities with me, Jason D'Souza. Is AI destroying education? Well, joining me to delve into this question is Dr. Helena Pachiti, Associate Director focused on education at the University of New South Wales. Helena. Welcome to Smarter Cities. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for the invitation. It's good to be here. It's an absolute pleasure having you. It's a, we're on a bit of a thematic on AI at the moment on uh, the show. So, and I think that sort of reflects a sort of increasing desire to sort of learn about what exactly AI is. You know, how does it actually affect society? And one of the things I think all of us are passionate about, particularly those of us who are parents, is what's the impact of AI in the classroom, yeah, and I think that's a, a really fascinating topic, so it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to have you here. Thank you. Um, before we get into it though, how did you become a lecturer on AI in education? Yeah, so I have a pretty unconventional journey <clears throat> into higher education. <clears throat> uh, so I left high school in year 10, I didn't mm -hmm. actually finish high school. Um, and now you're a PhD. And now I have a PhD, <laughs> yes. Uh, so I started, um, once I, I worked a few jobs that I didn't like and then I decided I was actually quite good at school and I wanted to um, go to uni to get a better job. So I um, used an alternate pathway entry and did a bridging course to get into uni and then always wanted to study psychology. It was just the, felt like the right choice for me. So I did really well in my bridging course. I got into psychology and I did well in my undergraduate. I ended up with a university medal and first class honours. Wow. Um, and so then I, en I ended up doing a PhD <clears throat> at UNSW where I now work. And I think my journey as a student really informs my teaching practice and also what I learned along the way as well. So I, my area for my, my research area for my PhD was looking at goal-directed behaviour and, and executive function. Goal-directed behaviour. Goal-directed okay. behaviour, yeah, in rodents. Um, so I looked at how methamphetamine impacts um, cognitive ability and executive function in animals. And so then I looked now, so teaching that, then I use that um, information to look at how students are tracking towards their study goals. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's fascinating. So just take a step back. Though. So you, you left school at year 10. Yeah. What made you leave school? What, what was it about school that didn't gel with you? I think for me personally, it just wasn't the right time. Um, I wanted to be independent um, and it wasn't that unusual in the mid 90s to leave school in year 10 mm. and I did work experience and got offered a job and so I just left. Yeah. I always had in my mind that if I wanted to I could go back and um, study at a time that was more suitable for me but I think there is power in um, being the underdog in a sense mm. because I engaged in what I now recognise as self-regulated learning because I understood that there were gaps in my knowledge compared to students that had finished their high school education. And so knowing what those gaps were and addressing them and, and identifying my areas of weaknesses, then I could, that's powerful and you, can, mm. you actually become a better student. But I think the, the key in what you're saying, though, is there wasn't actually a gap in your learning, it was just a gap. It was a change in the way you were learning. So uh, the reason why I'm asking this question is one of the great debates in public policy around education has mm. been the increase in the school leaving age, right? Yeah. And why are we doing that? Well, we're doing that because we're worried that there is a there is a transition point for students leaving the school system into adulthood, and that's where a lot of children fail. Yeah. That's where a lot of young people fail. They leave school, they end up not moving on to that next step, whatever that next step might be. For you, it was work. For others, it's an apprenticeship. For others, it might be some other form of vocational training. For others, it's finishing school and university. But a lot of kids are leaving and not sort of a lot. This is a generalization. Those who are leaving school earlier and not having that transition are at risk of sort of falling within the, in, in between a crack. So you obviously had a very clear sense of what you wanted to do at year 10, you said that learning was not quite for you. What's your, what's your impression of how you can help young people who are feeling the same as you in, in education um, think about what that next step is? I think 
It's a lot of it is, and this is hard because young people aren't, don't necessarily know themselves mm. yet. And I think... My 10-year-old would disagree with you. <laughs> I think, and to embark on a university degree once you've just finished high school, I think can be quite challenging for young people because, A, I don't think that the high school system necessarily prepares students terribly well for the kind of thinking that's required at university level. Mm. Um, but also, yes, it's a big financial commitment. It's a big time commitment. So you really need to know what you want to do before you embark on. How do you know? I mean, I had no idea. I knew I liked <laughs> business. I knew I liked economics. Uh, I always imagined I'd become a lawyer. Thank God I didn't become a lawyer. You know, I would have been a terrible lawyer, <laughs> right? So I just sort of, I don't think, I mean, isn't one of the arguments that you go to university, at least in your undergraduate level, to sort of discover what you want to do. Yeah, and people often do change their degree programs as well. Mm. There's um, a lot of people, my student, like I, I lecture in undergraduate psychology and I teach across quite a broad spectrum of mm. um, students. So I have students in my course that are psychology students, but also students that are art students or engineering students. And so quite often you see you say an engineering student, oh, I really like psychology. And then, you know, they might end up chopping and changing. I did the same. When I started on my undergraduate, I wanted to be a clinical psychologist. And mm. I realised now I'd make a terrible clinical <laughs> psychologist. <laughs> but I think psychologists have yeah. a lot to offer, particularly cognitive and behavioural psychologists, which is what my background is, mm. have a lot to offer education. So, um, but yeah, I think yeah. Every, you change. I think it's quite common that you change and it's good because, yeah, it's a discovery process in and of itself. You also don't get divergent thinking unless you try things, right? So yeah. I, I did a semester of psychology, actually, in oh. my undergraduate. Yep. I wasn't particularly good at it. Right. And I realised that, um, that, that perhaps um, that type of analysis of, of humanity is probably not my way of thinking about it, right? Yeah. Um, but it was interesting. Yeah. It was interesting. Yeah, it's very broadly applicable. Yeah. I mean, I mean economics is the study of, of, of human behaviour as well. It's just a different style of human behaviour. It's the it's the study really of, of incentives. Yeah. Right. And how do different incentives play in terms of running an economy? Yeah, well, at um, UNSW we're offering behavioural economics. Mm, as, yeah. As Which is becoming stuff. a really, really important field yeah. in terms of how we think about the and look, I think the sort of advent of um, of, of podcasts like Free Economics Radio. Oh, people are really engaging with this t style of economics because it's so um, it, it's so accessible. Yeah, like, you know, people can relate to it. You yeah, know, why do why do I react this way um, when these sorts of incentives are put in, into play? Right. I, I always I always um, refer to one of the things I always love is this concept of the law of small numbers. Right, where people will really stress over where they should buy a pair of shoes that is $150, mm -hmm. but they will easily bid another $5,000 on the house that they're um, at auction. Yeah. Like that, yeah, without that even thinking about it. Yeah. So the small purchases are ones that people really think yeah. deeply about. You yeah. know, um, my, my wife would kill me for saying this, but she was thinking about buying something the other day and it was $130 or something. And she was really deeply researching this thing. And mm. I'm like, why? Yeah. But you know, you'll you'll easily you know you'll easily spend something on something more. Yeah. Um, again, that's the that behavioral economics would explain that people mm. can understand that number, the hundred dollars, the hundred and fifty dollars. They can appreciate. They can touch it. A mm. hundred thousand dollars is something a little bit less tangible. Yeah, that is interesting. You know, inter yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, we're miles off the track here, <laughs> um, so that's okay. Um, I, I got I got hooked a little bit on your on your story. So let's go back to that. So you you went back to university. PhD is a pretty serious thing to pursue. Yeah, it was quite an undertaking. Mm. Um, it's I think a lot of it is not really about natural intelligence. I think it's a very much a war of attrition. And it's PhDs, persistence, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, yeah. and not giving up. Yeah. Um, and so, what made you want to jump off the cliff towards a PhD? Um. I had a very good experience in my honours year um, where I just fell in love with doing research and so I wanted to uh, explore research more with the, PH <clears throat> with the PhD and I was really interested in the topic that um, my supervisor was offering. So 
um, I have uh, interest in addiction and, mm. um, yeah, so that was, a, yeah, a big, a big pull for me. So I changed universities and came back to Sydney, which is where I'm originally from, and, yeah, studied, studied here. So you did your PhD at UNSW? No, I did my PhD at UNSW mm. and I did my undergraduate um, in James, at James Cook University oh, in okay. Cairns, which oh, was wow. a lovely experience. Yeah. They're um, a smaller university that aren't so research focused. So the quality of the education there was excellent. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, that was definitely another influence in terms of why I wanted to get into the teaching side of things because I don't do research anymore. Okay. So I'm yeah. an education focused lecturer. So yeah. I, um, which is a pathway. Do um, so you like people <laughs> in other words is what you're I, saying? Yeah. And it's funny when I recall, <laughs> when I look back on when I was deciding what to do in terms of uh, when I was um, doing the bridging course, the careers counsellor that I spoke to said, oh, these are based on your responses. They did like the typical personality type questionnaire and came up with a list of recommended professions and one of two of them one was a psychologist and one was a teacher so I'm like mm, pretty much well, it was <laughs> better me. than better than my career counselor what was when, yours when we um well it's a I've told the story before but I'll tell it again when we when we did our I did a master's in international relations one of the degrees and um the professor who's a very good guy he said um look we've got this careers thing mm. If you want to find out what type of taxi you're going to be driving, whether it's going to be a white taxi or a civil service taxi, you should go to this thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's That's right. Right. Thought, yeah, okay. okay, fair enough. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but hey, you know, yes. I feel enlightened. Um, well, so let's go a little bit into, into um, this is a topic you, you've been teaching on, and AI and education. So the um, question I, I think we're all asking is, AI has really come onto the scene for most um, most people um, with the rise of sort of chat GPT. Right? Yeah. So before that, AI was everywhere. Nobody really knew it. So AI was um, AI was in the way you do your shopping. It was mm. in the way you book flights. It was all it was all that back end system stuff. Um, in fact, one of my great friends, Hamish Ogilvy, has a, a business called Search IO, uh, and all he's been doing for the last ten years is AI. Um, oh, right. And so he's, but it's all back of house stuff, right? Yes. It's all, so it was all underneath. This is now with the rise of chat GPT, the sort of public are, are now attuned to it. And, and yes. today, this morning, it was a huge announcement that Microsoft is making a substantial investment in Australia around data centers, mm. data center capacity to support increased cloud capacity to support the rise of AI in yeah. business. And so, well, what does that mean? Well, People will start using AI in search in business, um, maybe how you search tender or legal documents, rising productivity standards. So there's no doubt that AI is going to make an appearance in education if it isn't there already. Yeah. One might argue it's already there, right? Yeah. Um, so why don't we start with uh, what are you seeing in education in terms of AI? What is starting to emerge in the classroom? Yeah, so... For us, AI burst on to the scene around November 2022, and it was quite a shock and slightly terrifying as well because it was at a time where we were sort of coming off the back of COVID and trying to adjust to our new normal and hoping things were, you know, going to be a little bit smoother for us because obviously in higher education, the, throughout the pandemic, things have been quite crazy and tumultuous mm. for us. <laughs> So hearing that news at the end of last year when we were all sort of starting to down, you know, on the downward spiral towards summer break was not particularly something that we wanted to think about straight away. Um, but, yeah, so I think our knee-jerk reaction was the biggest concern, I guess, was that students would be using these large language models to produce assessments. Mm. Um, and without doing it, the work themselves. So there were obvious integrity issues that came, that arose from that. Like, what are we going to do? How are we going to assess? How are we going to know that How students, are we going to know? Yeah. yeah, that students are producing this work? You know, it, particularly in fields like psychology. Like when you see a psychologist, you want to know that that person has met the requirements mm. in order to become a registered psychologist. 
So yeah, so the biggest issue for us when we came back at this beginning of the year was I think a lot of people and myself included, when I started teaching in term one, I banned use of it. But that became an issue because we didn't, the, the detection tools aren't very, aren't we there didn't, yet. yeah, well, they were there, but we didn't know how reliable they were. And so when my uh, cohorts essays started coming through, it became quite apparent that students were using it. Not all students, but a lot For of students. For an entire assessment? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It was quite obvious. Really? Yes. And the AI detectors just weren't picking up. So picking up some of some instances, yeah. but not all of them. And how high quality was the um, was the assessment? Some of it was it's well written and mm. that's the thing is is chat GPT is the output is very fluent and so mm. it can be quite convincing but when you have an expert pair of eyes on it yeah and you You'll catch it yeah, yeah you do you catch it certain things were popping out to me like why are students talking about that concept when I haven't taught that in the class mm. so it's something that was re related to the topic but not something that they would have come across at that level so that was a red, that's a red flag, but also ChatGPT 3, 3.5, which is the standard issue one, the one, not the one that you pay for. So it's the free one, makes up references. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so you would be reading an assignment and you'd yeah. be like, those two people don't publish together. Like <laughs> It makes up references. Yeah, and so, yeah, so I think, yeah, there, there were some definite, red flags that jumped out and it was obvious that students were using it. But my I, my feelings towards chat GPT have, and large language models in general have changed quite a bit. And I think most people in higher education are of the same opinion that it's here. Um, it's not going anywhere. And mm. we need to learn how, along with our students, how to use it, learn how to use it critically ethically and in a discipline appropriate way. So let, let's get into that. So the the initial initial reaction was they're going to use this to cheat. Yeah. And I think we saw a lot of that in the media, you know, um, Universities of Australia, I think published something, this is the greatest threat to higher education and all that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. So you, the initial reaction was complete. Now you're in a sort of place where saying, okay, this thing is here, there's gonna be a lot more of it. Yeah. Um, you know, we're on, what is it, four now? Yes. Um, there'll be five, 10, 20. So this thing is going to get more and more complicated and more mm. and more effective at what it does. So how are you approaching it now? So in term two, after my experience in term one, I allowed students to use it, but warned them of the, <clears throat> the pitfalls of doing so. So, which can be quite difficult because, well, one of my clever colleagues terms um, the output of ChatGPT to be shiny bollocks. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's a matter Clearly of- somebody from Britain. Right? <laughs> it's a matter of teaching students to understand the requirements yeah. of the course, which is a metacognitive mm. skill, yeah. but also being able to not fall for the shiny bollocks. So being able to critically review, critically think about the output that it's providing. Some things it does very well. So it does coding very well. Mm. It does summarizing very well. So um, yeah, it's a matter of teaching the strengths and the strengths that it has and the limitations that it has and trying to get students to use that to their advantage. Um, one of my very clever colleagues, uh, she, she embraced um, ChatGPT straight from the get-go. And she has a particular assessment that she's done in her course where they um, students peer review their uh, like, so they have a piece of assessment, they write a draft, and then part of the assessment is providing other students with feedback on their drafts. And then they incorporate that feedback and then they submit mm. their assignment. That's always been really useful and it actually it's quite an authentic piece of assessment because in academia, when you submit a paper, it goes to peer review. So being able to, being feedback literate and being able to incorporate feedback into your writing or your work is really important. But 
when the, the, the medium changed from students submitting the draft to each other or submitting the draft to chat GPT, she found that students found it very, very difficult to, to critique the output of chat GPT because of the fluency, because it's so well written. Mm. Yeah. I, the thing that worries me a little bit about this is, so let's say, you know, 40% of the class decided to use chat GPT. That effectively means they're cheating themselves of the ability to learn what they're there to learn, which then reduces their critical thinking. Yeah. Right. And a lot of my, um, my uh, colleagues will say, you know, the thing with, with the thing with, with people today is no one, no one writes anything anymore. No one reads anything anymore. Um, you know, in business, we're, we're slide obsessed. We love slides. So everything's picture based, you know, um, and uh, I'm looking at you, Aaron, because uh, I know you like uh, you like me writing less on slides, right? Um, <laughs> I, you know, and there's something to be said for that. A lot of that is about less about, to be fair, a lot of that is less about the content and more about how to get things across to people clearly. Yeah. But that's quite different. That that communication technique is quite different from the risk of damaging critical thinking in universities through using this sort of technology. Yeah. And so. It sounds to me like you're, you and your colleagues are working to try and get that balance right at the moment. Yeah, and, and embedding pr the process, like uh, assessing the process of learning is a really important part of how we are now rethinking assessment. So um, the good thing with ChatGPT is you can use it in a, in a number of different ways. So it can be used quite effectively, but yeah, you do have to make sure that people have those critical thinking skills to be able to analyse the information and, and evaluate it when they're receiving it. So it's similar to fake news. Mm. We know that people that um, endorse fake news are less um, educated than people that are less likely to endorse fake news. And so some colleagues um, of mine at UNSW recently published a paper where they looked at people's susceptibility to endorsing um, fake news or mm. misinformation. And it wasn't that so much that these people are um, cognitive misers or lazy thinkers. They just don't, they, they just lack the hardware in order or this, yeah the mind where is is the mm. term that's used or like the decision making architecture to make informed rational choices yeah uh, the fake news one is one i find really difficult though because yeah there is so many news sources now yeah uh and it's all very well presented uh, and it all looks quite legitimate so how do you discern what is fake news and what isn't fake news and what is a particularly dri viewpoint driven piece of news on this side versus a viewpoint driven piece of news on that side? Yeah, that's a really good question because it's so important, isn't it, mm -hmm. in this post-truth world that yeah. we live in? Um, and I think education has a huge role to play there. Um, I think like my first piece of advice would be don't get your news from social media. <laughs> yeah. I think that horse may have bolted. Though, right? <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, yeah, a lot of people, that is how a lot of people are getting mm. their news. Um, my preference would be to what try access your news via your national broadcaster. Mm. Uh, they do make mistakes, um, but I think there is a higher level of um, critiquing that goes on there. And there's fact-checking mm. Um, websites and things like that yeah. as well. Um, they themselves have got them to, themselves into trouble. Though. Yeah, like um, I think the more tools mm, that you have in yeah. your toolbox to be able to th think critically, the better armed we are in terms of combating yeah. misinformation because there is a lot out there. Um, there is. But then the, the, the critical thinking thing is also interesting because in a pluralistic society with a diversity of viewpoints, what makes us successful as a free society is the fact that we can have different viewpoints and argue about them and debate them, mm, right? Yes. And I might think that your view is completely inaccurate and wrong. Yep. And you might think that my idea is completely inaccurate and wrong, and that's fine. Yes. Because that's how human beings have always interacted, and that's actually what makes us a more effective society. Mm. It allows us to create 
innovation that allows us to produce better outcomes. The problem with misinformation now is that we are, we are not having that debate. We're not having a debate from, we're not having a, a, a debate from any intellectual basis anymore. We're simply just putting out propaganda. So mm. I, I don't believe there's anything new in the world. I only think there's, there are things that are variants of things, right? Mm. So to me, today's digital fake news challenge is no different to the propaganda wars of, uh, of you know, decades and centuries ago. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. not a new concept, propaganda. Yeah. I think um, the sign, knowledge of the scientific method can be, and this is, I think, where education can come in, is understanding um, what evidence-informed choices. So the, a good example of this is the recent voice referendum where one claim was made that most Indigenous people don't support the voice to Parliament. Mm. And so when the result, but the results indicate something quite different. So if you look at particular, not just electorates, but polling booths within certain electorates, so you take a deeper dive into the data and you see that the communities with pol from pol polling booths that come from communities where the um, populations predominantly Indigenous were overwhelmingly mostly mm. in support of, of the change to the constitution. So I think it's, yes, being able to access data. Um, mm. So say in news stories, if there's health data or anything like that, but to try and investigate it yourself, don't rely on the interpretation of someone yeah, else I because agree. it's adul adulterated. Yeah. I agree. One that, yeah. you know, it's the further away it gets from the primary source, the more adulterated it gets because people's bias comes in. And and I, I do find now in, in news, there's a lot more opinion journalism mm. than there used to be. Yeah. Like there's a lot of opinion pieces, a lot of opinions, fine. Yeah. But I almost feel... And this is just a personal view. I almost feel there's more opinion than there is news <laughs> these days, right? Yeah. And it's difficult just to get the news. Yeah. yeah. I think the national yeah. broadcasters are more yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, supposed to be not biased mm. and a bit more balanced. But but still, that then leaves it up to the individual to, you yeah. know, to make their own informed yeah. choice. Yeah. yeah. And you can do that by understanding... You know, having a good mind, we're having good decision-making architecture. Mm. I think the key point you made was evidence. Yes. That's the key, right? Yeah. Let's go back to a classroom because I think that's, a, <laughs> that's an interesting sure. place. So I want to go a little bit to, to AI and the school classroom as opposed to the university classroom. Because mm. I, I do think universities, you are dealing with young adults, mm. right? And they're... they're on a journey of learning that's at a much higher level, whereas at school level, it's really foundational education, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of, some more and more research seems to be coming about, out about the impact of social media on young minds, mm. right? And when, when do you provide access or allow access to social media for young children? Mm. And what is the right thing to do? So, you know, there's a, there's a, um, a, a academic in the United States, Jonathan Haidt, who argues that um, the impact of social media on young minds is really damaging and you shouldn't really provide anything like Facebook or Instagram or anything like that until after they're 16. Yeah. Um, that's one perspective. And, you know, and he has a range of uh, sort of, um, of views around that. What's your view? Yeah, so, <laughs> so there, there is quite strong evidence now that... So, so the more time young people spend on social media, it can have quite a negative impact on their mental health. Um, and that's, yeah, quite, there's correlation studies. So the more time people spend on social media, there's a decline in their mental health. And this is a perfect example of digging deeper into the evidence for it and digging deeper into the data because initially the correlations for the link between um, social media use and mental health were weak, weakish, mm. like strong, like there, but but not terribly compelling. But digging deeper into it, it, it became quite obvious that it's quite bad for younger women, mm. and less so for younger men. But when you just look at the, the, you know, both sexes combined, then 
it bo it's watering down the effect. So yeah. I think that's a perfect example of sort of having a deeper dive into something. I think in, in terms of cognitive development, I think more research needs to be done there. Um, and no doubt, I think there's, there's a lot of people working on that already. Mm. Um, I think there is some suggestion that for older people, um, social media use has had a positive impact on their cognitive ability. Really? Yeah. Um, but also it's sort of disentangling the what's, it's not necessarily cause and effect relationship, so it's understanding what the root cause of it is, like what is causing the effect, rather than just saying, oh, well, social media is good for older people. It's understanding the impacts of, like what it is that's driving that effect. So if you think of the impact that, um, social media use is having on young adults mental health mm. then that is if they if it's making young people depressed or anxious mm. then that is going to have an impact on their cognition because people that are depressed or anxious are have trouble more trouble concentrating more trouble applying themselves and so yeah it's you need to understand is is the effect on cognition because there's an underlying mental health issue that's not being addressed. So you need to be careful there. I think there is also a place, I'm not for banning social media use with kids or young people generally, mm. because I think it is also a source of psychosocial support and interaction that's really important for young people. I know my students use social media in a very positive way to support each other, to motivate each other. Um, so I think it does have a role to play. What I think is important is that we teach young people the pitfalls of it and how to control or regulate their own, their use of it. So how, how, do, how are the young people you're dealing with who are slightly older than school-aged children, but yeah, quite, quite a bit older than school-aged yeah. children. I'm just interested on that point. How are they use? What what type of social media are they using to yes. interact and motivate each other? Yeah, so I teach a lot online, mm. um, and we have in our learning management system we have a forums where they can contact me and ask questions and things like that. An accessible lecturer, my goodness! <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, mean, I think like having timely responses is, I think, really important for mm. online learning, and it's something I know my students need from me. Um, but they can't post me a question at four a.m., which is what they can do on other mediums, other platforms yeah. like Facebook Messenger and Instagram, um, and Discord and WhatsApp and things like that. So they have. They're often members of multiple groups. Oh, okay. So they communicate with each other. Yeah, they yeah. communicate with each other. Hey, I'm working on this assignment. Is yeah. anyone awake? Yeah. What is the answer to? Yeah. yeah. Even just that sense of solidarity that yeah. everyone's up at 4 a.m. I hate the fact that they're up at 4 a.m. doing yeah. their assignments. <laughs> it's the only time I did assignments. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, yeah, I think there's that element of... Um, they're using it in a way to co-regulate their studies and to support each other and motivate motivate each yeah, other. It that, can go pear shaped. I though. can see that. I mean, that's that's. I mean, when you know, in, in the 1800s, when I was at university, as I was saying, I, we used text message for that, right? Like yeah. text was still a thing yeah. back on the Nokia 335. <laughs> yeah. Great phone. Yeah. I think I had an Ericsson, but anyway. <laughs> Flip <laughs> phone. Probably. Yeah. But we used text, right? Yeah. And um, there wasn't. I think there was a very early messenger system, MSN, I think it was, mm, that yes. we were using, right? Yeah. So I can see social media, that type of social media working quite well. Yeah. I think where I, I am increasingly focused is around the sort of Facebooks and the, and the Instagrams and the TikToks and the, the need for people to want to demonstrate something on these platforms mm. in a way of showing that they are they're achieving something, they're doing something, they're, they're mm. better, right? So yeah. I think with kids, you know, well, look, let's, even adults, let's put it this way, no one posts a picture of themselves, you know, at work, you know, at you know, working on front of their computer, <laughs> right, in their job, right? That's not, that's not something they would, but what would they post? They would post themselves speaking at a conference or mm. they would post themselves on a boat. In, talking on a know, podcast. Talking on a <laughs> podcast, right? You know, um, because you're trying to demonstrate that life is or on a holiday or, yeah. you know. So on one hand, 
that's something to celebrate. You know, hey, look, guys, I'm, you know, I, I've had this opportunity. Isn't that great? Yeah. On the other hand, people might look at that and go, well, how come that isn't me? And yeah. what's the mental health impact of that? Yeah. And I think as adults, we can process that a lot better than children. Yeah. So I think of my, my daughters. You mentioned women uh, or girls are impacted by, by this slightly more than boys. I can understand that because I, can, I see, I, I just wonder, and a lot of parents in the school friendship group, we talk about the fathers are all talking about this. Like, how, how do we manage this with our daughters when they get into a school, you know, in a school setting where, you know, being a young, a young woman growing up in a school is a tough process. I mean, I remember yeah. the girls that I went to school with, it was hard for them. Yeah. We, we, we watched on as boys as they went through that, that growing up process. And yeah. we didn't have social media at that time. Yeah. And it was still a, sort of a pretty difficult process. Now, you're a girl, you, you, you tell me. I mean, how was it for you at school? And what was it like? If, if, imagine social media when you were growing up. Yeah, I th the thought of that terrifies me. <laughs> and I'm, That's I'm not a mother what I wanted a, to hear. I'm the mother of a seven-year-old as well, he, a girl, boy. But, a boy, um, yeah. He, yeah. yeah, the thought of social media I don't media think it's going to be any easier for boys. No. Um, yeah. You know, to... I think the social comparison side of it does yeah. concern me. Is and that what terrifies you? That, I mean, the bullying, yeah. I think the fact that they were, that phones were banned in schools, I'm 100% yes, for that. I'm I just don't totally, think that yeah. having phones at school adds anything to the educational experience. No. AI is a different thing, but in terms of taking them out of schools, yes, I think that's... We will that's, get back to AI in a second. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a matter of teaching, pe teaching young people how to regulate their activity on it and their responses to things that they're seeing and doing and getting them to think critically. I think one of the big concerns has to do with needing external validation. That's that's yeah. the thing. That's the thing, right? Yeah, rather yes. than having that within yourself. Um, and also, you know, it's distracting and, yeah. you know, it's a big dopamine hit just scrolling. And, yeah, and that's yeah. the thing, right? So you keep getting these little yeah. hits. So, you, you know, can get very overstimulated. And you can be addicted to it, right? Um, yeah, I think and my children accuse me of being addicted to my phone, but I'm not <laughs> looking at social media all the time. Like, I'm addicted to things that are far less interesting yeah. than my yeah. like email. Well, I, my think, <laughs> I think the whole digital detox thing is something that yeah. we all need. We all need that time to just switch off and mm. turn our brains off. It's why, you know, you shouldn't be looking at your phone before you go to bed. And mm. you we, need that, that your brain needs that time. I've to, banned to, phones from bedrooms. That's great. Everyone. Yeah. Right. Um, I haven't, but. <laughs> it's, it's changed, I uh, to be honest, it's changed my life, right? Yeah. Uh, not having a phone in the bedroom means I can't think about anything else other than, you know, going to bed. Yeah. Which would be a nice thing to do occasionally, yeah. right? So, <laughs> but I, I, I do worry, I mean, the external validation thing, yeah. I don't think, again, is a new thing. We've all wanted some form of, you know, humans value yeah. external validation, Of course, right? yeah. I mean, I, you're talking to a psychologist here, I'm all about positive reinforcement. Correct, but right? you do also need to believe in yourself, which is something that, but that's the that's the thing that terrifies me is making sure that my children, our children, have that skill set to be able to yeah. say, I don't really I, I, I like it when people tell me things, I like the feedback, I like I like hearing about how I can improve. But if someone is telling me things that actually, you know, the negative, they're deliberately negative and mm. they're trying to put me down or they're trying to they're trying to make themselves feel better yeah. by attacking me. Mm. How do I defend against that, particularly when it's in a social media setting? And I think we all agree that people, people say things on social media that they would never say in yeah. person to another human being. Keyboard warriors, yeah. Keyboard it's, warrior, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is concerning. I think, you know, we need to work on building resilience is, mm. you know, a really important thing. Um, life's not about, it's a, about celebrating your successes, but also embracing your failures and your, and your weaknesses. Mm. Not everyone's good at everything. I tell no. my son that all the time. I tell myself that all the time. Yeah, I tell um, myself and I that I think too. everyone's walking around with imposter syndrome, but we all mm. have something to offer. And so it's a matter of playing to your strengths. So many people who've come on the show have talked about imposter syndrome too. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. I, I, that's why I always start the show with, 
how did you get into this? And most people say, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. <Right. laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think, it, but again, yeah. it's back to the power of the underdog when yeah. you, you know, um, there's, I think, imposter syndrome, everyone has it to some extent, yeah. I think. Like in a way, it makes you better. Yeah, like if you don't, absolutely. If you're not believing your own, your own, uh, your, your own hype, Mm. It actually sort of makes you check yourself every so often. Yeah, right? and it keeps you motivated, keeps you striving towards what it is that you want to achieve. I, one of my favourite um, lines uh, that I it took me a long time to learn it is to, to openly admit in a room full of extremely intelligent people that I have no idea what they're talking about. Yes. Right. So I've got guys. I don't. I don't understand this. Explain this to me in a. Yeah. Explain this to me in a way that I can comprehend it. Yeah. And the reason why I had to learn that lesson is because nine times out of 10, probably 10 out of 10, I am not the smartest person in the room and there are people who are experts in their field yeah. who are in the room and the whole purpose of being effective at your role or your job is to not be the smartest person in the room yeah. and to have the experts in the room so you can actually make a decision yeah. that you know increases an outcome or delivers an outcome, right? Yeah, I think people need to be more comfortable with not having all the answers. Mm. I mean, one really good piece of advice that my PhD supervisor gave me um, as I was nervously preparing for like a f the first international conference that I'd spoken at, and I knew that I was going to be a, in a room full of experts in my field. And you can prepare, you know, a lot for a conference talk because you, you just talk through your slides and I was well prepared in that sense. But the biggest thing for me, the scariest thing about giving a talk is the questions. Yeah. Because that's <laughs> out unscripted. of my yeah. locus of control. So, yeah. um, and being able to understand a question or indeed having the answer to something. Mm. And so one of the best pieces of, of advice that my supervisor gave me was, it's okay to say, I don't know. Mm. You're a PhD, you're supposed yeah. to know. Like, <laughs> I don't know, or I didn't think of that. That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. 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 It's a great line, isn't it? Yeah, it I, is. I, it's really good. It's, it's really useful. It's got me through my career. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to AI in the classroom. So talk about AI in universities. Mm -hmm. So at school, yes. how is AI being deployed in the classroom? Yes. So are you talking about in primary school? In primary, secondary school, primary yeah. school. So the first, in New South Wales, the, fir the first reaction was similar to my experience in term one is that, the, that they banned it. Mm. So that was the first, so it's banned presently in New South Wales classrooms, okay. but as of term one next year, students are going to start using it. So all of the um, state education ministers and the federal education minister came together and have agreed upon a framework for um, how to use it in, like how to adopt it in, in teaching, because it's, we have to just accept that it's mm. here, and but it's important to learn how to use it and to teach students how to use it. So, yeah. And how are they going to use it? Is it similar to how they how you're doing it at university? Are they saying go and do this assignment? You can use ChatGPT for your research. Mm, I well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know specifically for for primary students. I know um, what how we plan to adopt it in higher education. And I think what's really important moving forward is that there's more crosstalk between the levels of education. Mm. So what we're doing with primary school students needs to prepare them for high school and what's happening in high school and how they're using it in high school needs to prepare them for what they'd be doing post high school, whether that be at university or whether that be at TAFE or in any it's, it's that, There's that transition point again, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think we've known for a while that high school doesn't necessarily prepare students for university level thinking very well. They yeah. come from a very structured environment where a lot of schools will teach to the test. And so they, you know, in year 11 and 12, they're doing testing all the time. Yeah. And so it's very, very structured. But then they come into university and it's completely the opposite. There's more flexibility. Um, there is more choice. They have to regulate their own learning more. And so it's a big change. And I think the more overlap and preparation there is during those transition years, the better we will be. I think we've learnt as well that that transition from school to university or school to vocation is, yes, the, yes, the learning part 
in the classroom is very important, no doubt. That's your base, right? But the extracurricular stuff is really where you learn the sort of social skills that um, are so critical in higher education and in business and in your career afterwards. Yeah. And so I mean, one thing I'm saying to my kids is you must play a team sport. doesn't matter whether you're any good at it. Mm. doesn't matter. You're not... You don't need to aspire to be an Olympian if you don't want to, but it's not about the sport, it's about the camaraderie. It's about yes. your colleagues, it's about playing in a team, it's about backing each other, right? And it's about learning what everyone's role is. You might have a superstar player. The job is not for that superstar player to be a superstar, it's for us to all support that superstar to win the game as a team. Right? Absolutely. Those lessons are, are important. Yeah, I think that's super important. It's um, a great learning experience for kids working playing team sports and also collaborating with yeah. other people towards yeah. a common goal. I mean, every discipline pretty much is working in a cross-disciplinary environment in some way. I know in, in psychology, one of the graduate capabilities we um, graduates walk away with is that they have to have interpersonal skills. Mm. So being able to work with other people and do it effectively towards to reach a common goal is something that's really important. Yeah, so absolutely. the more exposure student, um, young kids have to, to those sorts of experiences, the better. Are your kids going to that mind quest thing? No. Yeah. What so is mind, mind quest? Mind quest is this incredible thing. It's this. Um, it's sort of an extracurricular school activity they do once, I think once, uh, twice a year, and they all go out to this high school and they they mix with kids from other schools in a particular task. So. Um, one is like an engineering thing. They go and build things together and they have to collaborate with people they've never met before wow, that's from amazing. other schools. Wow. And it's, um, it's broken up by year and, uh, and then they have to do a presentation to the parents afterwards. And th this is a public school educated thing, wow. uh, um, organized thing. That's amazing. I just think it's <laughs> tremendous, right? Yeah, and I'm like, great. well, that's actually in a way more educational yeah. than... Um, than uh, much of the in-classroom learning. Yeah, um, definitely. That's I am enrolling my son next year. Yeah, it's fantastic, <laughs> yeah. right? So I'm, I'm looking. Uh, they, the kids are looking forward to it. I know they are. Yeah. Um, we'll have to end soon. I've been given the signal. Oh, God, um, that but went we really can, fast. It uh, goes fast, <laughs> doesn't it? Um, yeah. Look, fascinating conversation. Lots changing in the world. Lots changing in education. What are three things we should be looking out for? Um, in terms of te like how students can use AI? Yeah, how or? students are using AI. Yep. What, what should we be concerned about? What shouldn't we be? So I think, I know my students are using it a lot for drafting, drafting their writing, um, but they can be using it in a lot more, in, in better ways. Yeah. So a lot of what needs to they need to learn is prompting. So... Um, there's, I think, in popular media, these people are referred to as AI whisperers. So the, getting the prompts right. Oh, the question yeah, to prompt ask, engineering. Yeah. So <laughs> prompt engineering. <laughs> um, prompt engineering. Yeah. Wow. So students okay. are using it for drafting, like relieving writer's block for sort of yeah. just simple idea generating yeah. as a study buddy. And I think all of that's great. It's okay. Um, as long as they have the mind where architecture to be able to evaluate what the output is saying right so another way that you can use it quite effectively in terms of self-regulated learning which is something I'm quite passionate about is using it as a way to generate um, sort of questions multiple choice questions or um, real world examples of um, concepts covered in a course those are really good ways of studying because when you relate, say when you provide a real world example of something, say my course, I teach um, a lot of old school behavioural psychology stuff, so positive and negative reinforcement. And what I try and encourage my students to do is to come up with a real world example of what that is. So what is positive reinforcement? Give me an example. And so being able to use ChatGPT to, to embrace effective study strategies is really something that we should be helping students to do. Because when they, and, and generating multiple choice quizzes for themselves, like based on particular content. Oh, so they can help them learn the content. Yeah, yeah. so what they're doing there is they they can gauge their, like we have multiple choice questions quite a lot. I use them a lot in my course, but, you know, using ChatGPT to to generate other ones that they might not have come across. And, and doing that, they're able to 
evaluate how they're going. So, so this is a basically like the, doing a past exam or something, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. So, so being able to monitor their progress and evaluate how they're going, which is really important because a lot of students have trouble gauging their real understanding of their, their knowledge or how much they know about something. Um, so being able to, to provide that sort of um, self-regulating loop um, using ChatGPT for that is, is um, a good way forward, I think. Excellent. Well, yeah, and teaching critical thinking, of course. Well, yeah. 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 There's so much to think about here, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Helena Petici, thank you so much for being part of Smart Thank Cities. you. Thanks, Jason.